Gentlemen, could you all do me a favor and turn your mics off if you're not? This I can still hear it for some reason. Um, I'll have a look at the list. That's better. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow uh, members and um, officers. Welcome to the uh, Exmoor Consultative Paris Forum meeting for the 17th of March. I will go straight into any apologies for absence. Hazel? Yeah, I have a few. We have Christine Lawrence, Sarah Buchanan, Richard Partington, Louise Crossman, Dean Kinsella, Rachel Thomas, Jan Aldridge, and actually we've got one of our speakers, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Western Power, Chris Garnsworthy. Right. Thank you. Um, any other apologies for absence? I think Mike Andrea Davis emailed me last night to say that she was late joining. I don't know whether she has arrived yet or not, but she said she I, thought she'd be late. I don't see her on the list. Not yet. Lovely, thank you. Right, minutes of the meeting that was held on the uh, 16th of September. Can I take them as a true record of that meeting, please? No answers from anybody. I take it that that is the true record of the meeting. A proposal for those minutes. Approve those minutes. Okay, Mike, I propose. Seconder. Have we got a seconder? Yes, I'll do it. Right, thank you very much. Right. And um, consider any minutes, uh, any matters arising from those minutes. Anybody got any questions on those minutes that they wish to ask on the matters arising? No? That's good. Thank you very much. Number three, any questions from the floor, Hazel? Do you know of any? No, I didn't receive any this time. You didn't receive any. Right. So uh, the original item was um, has had to be cancelled, item four, because um, Chris Garnsworthy uh, couldn't make it, so they pulled out of that one. So we'll go straight on to uh, Southwest Energy Hub presented by David Lewis. David? Thank you very much, Chair. I would just try and share our chat with Hazel that I'm having major problems with my teams at the moment. So let me give this a go. And if not, I've got a backup. <laughs> I like backups. <laughs> Can we see that? Yes. Yeah, coming through loud and clear. Blimey, it's worse. <laughs> okay. Right, so I uh, introduced myself. So I'm David Lewis. I'm the project manager for the Southwest Energy Hub, and I cover the areas of Haas Southwest, um, LEP. So that's the Local Economic Partnership. That covers the sort of 90% of Somerset and 100% of Devon. I also cover the, the Dorset LEP area as well, and I'm the lead for heat for the hub. So today I've been asked by Exmoor National Park after doing some work for them on one on Pinkery, uh, their centre at Pinkery. I'm doing their Salix bid to have that decarbonised. Um, they asked me if I would speak to you and explain some of the other functions that we have, primarily around community energy and working with our community groups and parish councils. Um, so that is what I intend to do. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I can't see you because obviously you've got my own presentation mode, but happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, and I've tried to pitch this today as a giving a brief overview of who we are, works we've done with, rural com uh, with our Rural Community Energy Fund, which has unfortunately has just closed, but we're hoping for more money from next April. Um, and also some of the work that our parishes and communities are doing around the heart of the Southwest. 
So I'm going to give a brief overview of who we are. So we were set up uh, actually three years ago yesterday uh, by BAES, the Department of Energy and Industry, um, from primarily an under, uh, a realisation that local authorities and parishes and uh, other groups lacked uh, the technical knowledge to help deliver projects, uh, energy projects. So they set us up. There are five of us to cover each region of the southwest uh, of, the, of the UK, of England. Um, and we cover the whole southwest region, which goes from Gloucester to Penzance all the way. And we actually cover Solent and Isle of Wight. So we have a huge area to cover. As with all government organisations, we've got our primary objectives. So we are really here to identify and develop local energy projects and really projects at scale. So we're there to increase the number and quality of projects. We're there to provide some regional leadership um, and to help Bayes liaise with partners uh, and stakeholders, but also then to pass our concerns back up to the government and ministers. We're there to help attract public and private finance to projects and help people to develop those packages. We're there to identify opportunities for, for new income and also then to support the national and local government in, in, in their things. And also we've got a new uh, uh, role to collaborate and coordinate and share best practice. So we have some funding, uh, not a lot, as with most government departments nowadays. So we have our local capacity support funding, which pays for myself and five, six other project managers around the region. All of us usually uh, have a technical speciality. Um, so mine is, I've worked in heat for approximately 12 years within biomass, air source heat pumps, combining with power. And also my other, uh, my other element is energy audits. We have the Rural Community Energy Fund, which was probably 1.8 million. Um, which I'll go into a little bit more in detail later. We also deliver on behalf of government the Green Homes Grant local authority delivery. So this is retrofit for the socially and fuel, social and fuel poor. So we're currently delivering approximately 52 million pounds worth of funding across the whole of the Southwest region. And uh, we, we have recently just received funding for our public sector decarbonisation, which uh, links back to work that I've been doing with Exxon National Park about decarbonising their buildings. So we're actually setting up a team that is going to be purely focused to help the public sector um, gather the data so they can decarbonise their, their, their estates and their buildings. So community groups. We have a, a big focus on our community groups and we see them as a vehicle for delivery. Um, we are blessed in that, especially in the heart of Southwest, of having, I think at last count, there were over 40 partnerships uh, at community and parish level. So the, I've put a map here. These are what I consider active. So these people have actually applied for funding, <coughs> the Energy Fund, or have active projects on the go. And as you can see, we have a fair scattering of, 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 of projects. They do range in scale. We've got Plymouth Energy Community, which is probably our largest community energy partnership, which is a partnership that was set up by Plymouth, uh, Plymouth City Council. And they are delivering um, uh, you know, millions of pounds worth of funding for, for Plymouth City Council, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later with a, with a case study of one of their projects. David, yes. sorry, you're still on the first page. Am I? Ah. I mean, for some reason. I will hold it two seconds. Would it be better if I go through it? Can you see that one now? Yeah, I can see that. Thank right. you. I, I, maybe this is one of the problems I had. It's not showing. So, so that's uh, that's my beautiful picture I made. So you didn't yeah. see that. Can you make it full screen as well? I think that if I make it full screen, that's when it won't flip over. And that's the problem we've been having with Teams on that's presentations. Because right. it was on full screen. Um, and then obviously you weren't seeing it. So, Chair, if you're okay with it like this. Yes, I am. I am. Okay. So, I really cut this. So that gives you an idea of where our community energy partnerships are. Uh, it doesn't show all of them. Um, there are some very small ones. There's some new embryonic ones around Crediton, which are just coming forward. Uh, but these are what I've considered. Uh, these mainly have websites. They have active projects and have been delivering energy projects in, in their communities. So, for us, really community groups and they are a focus and Bayes and, and government um, are recognizing the power and the need for community groups and, and for me why you know I've worked a lot of my uh, two, three years with the community groups around Devon and Somerset and Dorset for me they are it's about empowering local people 
that these, kept, these people now have some real skills in project management, finance, feasibility, and technical skills around the actual energy technologies. And this helps develop skills base at community level. For me, it's also about local ownership. It de-risks delivery of projects. Community groups are able to deliver projects that the private sector cannot, for example, large-scale solar, and in particular, wind. Um, because if they have the engagement and the buy-in from the community, these projects tend to get through planning. And also is a requisite of any planning or local plans now that they have to have that community support. Also the income derived from these projects because the community groups raise their capital for the delivery of the projects through share schemes, um, that, pro that money and any profits are redistributed locally. So for example, you'll see in, a, in, in my case study later, you know, Plymouth Energy community through their solar farm are going to be uh, distributing about three million pounds over the next 20 years around their local communities from that from that energy project. They work in partnerships uh, with local authorities or, uh, and they can de-risk projects for local authorities. I'm spending a lot of time trying to get the local authorities of, of Devon and Somerset um, to work more closely because they can actually de-risk those projects for local authorities. Um, and take the onus of delivering, especially the operational management of these assets uh, in, in the years to come. And primarily, as we go move forward on the climate agenda, then our communities and parishes and those local groups are gonna be far, are gonna be key for the delivery of, of, of those actions that are gonna be required really from 2040 onwards. And we need that engagement with our communities to help deliver those. So, we have had just closed literally last uh, this month the rural community energy fund um but i will go into it because we have applied under our new uh contract with bays for the next three years we have asked for significantly more money for community energy projects so and this will give you an idea of what we've done over the last two years so we had the rural community energy fund where we could deliver or, or through application through an application process Community groups and parish councils and some charities could apply up to £40,000 for feasibility grants in the first outset, and also then up to £100,000 in stage two for development grants. So the main aims of these were support our rural communities to maximise their income, to increase the uptake of community-owned renewable energy, and also to promote rural growth and job creation. We in the Haas Southwest, uh, I'm not going to beat my own drum too much, um, we're, we're the most successful LEP area for rural community, for, for, for taking funds for the community energy, for rural community energy fund. We actually had a total of 24 uh, applications and we approved 17 grants. And as you can see there, we uh, over half a million or 600,000 pounds worth of funding has approved for projects. So I'll go into my case study a bit to give you an example of that, but I also wanted to show what current activity is going on in Devon. I've also got some activity that's going on in Somerset. Um, so to give you an understanding of why and what some of our community groups are doing. So Devon uh, in the region is probably leading the way of working with community groups. And that's through a partnership called Cozy Devon, where the community groups, the local authorities and the county council and the unitaries are all in partnership to help deliver energy energy related projects and climate change actions for the county of Devon. They have coalesced under one umbrella under this brand and revamped this brand um, to actually develop a new program called Devon People Powered Retrofit. And this is our community group saying that we have money from government for the socially fuel poor, but we also one of the largest um, carbon, the largest percentage of carbon footprint for the Devon as a whole is around our properties and heat and electrical use within our homes. So this is um, called what we call in, in, in the retrofit business, able to pay market. So that's the, it's, it's really us or myself <laughs> sitting in my house will need to be better insulated, change off of a fossil fuel heating system to hit the, the Devon's soon to be published climate, climate uh, emergency targets. So the, what they've decided to do is actually form a new body and they're coming together as one group really to give a one-stop shop for impartial advice for all the population of Devon. They are going to be offering home energy performance um, improvement reports which are quite lengthy and require a, a, a professional to do. Uh, there may be some funding or we're seeking funding to, um, to assist with that. 
They're going to help people and, and, and communities make decisions about what they do with their houses. They're going to help them how they actually go out and procure local installers to do that. And we're also going to offer a quality control. So for, for everybody, we're going to say, has this been installed correctly? Have they done the installation correctly and offer this service as well? Other activity we've got doing with our communities, we've got FRICO, which is Froome's uh, Rural Energy Community uh, Energy Co-op. Um, they have three projects which they've applied that they've taken funding for under Rural Community Energy Fund. They have Zero Carbon Saxon Vale, which is a new housing development that they're working with, with Mendip to, de uh, to make carbon zero through a uh, district heating and integrated um, uh, power generation and EVs and battery storage. They also have um, an application in for two wind turbines of four megawatts each on the outskirts of Froome. And also they're working with another developer to decarbonize their development by putting um, up to a six megawatt solar farm on the periphery of the development to have um, for that to be private wired into that uh, new housing development. Uh, recently, Avalon Community Energy has been working in partnership with the Glass uh, with Glastonbury Town Council on their town deal bid, and, and they have are going to be awarded or have been awarded up to between three and four million pounds to help decarbonize um, and take decarbonized actions for Glastonbury. Primarily, they're looking at a large ground mounted solar array uh, in the area. I think this is going to be around two megawatts, but also looking at more rooftop panels for community and industrial retail buildings, batteries uh, for uh, grid balancing. Um, looking at power purchase agreements, which I won't go into too much today, um, looking at coordination of EV charging and Grix export and actually providing local consumers with cleaner energy, primarily through a thing called energy. Finally, I'd just like to go through a case study from Plymouth Energy Community. So this is probably one of my our, our most successful um, community groups. And I think the success comes down to, as I speak to other local authorities, is that they worked in partnership with their local authority from day one. There were shared offices, there were shared officer space, and uh, they've been in, uh, and now they are beginning to become a, a separate arms length delivery organisation for the council. So they applied to us for uh, stage one funding of £40,000 to look and investigate whether it was possible to put a solar farm on an old waste uh, site uh, on the outskirts of Plymouth near Saltram. Um, and to put a solar fund there. The feasibility study was, was very good and came out that the financial and the carbon savings and the, and the initial um, engagement with communities was good. So they then were awarded uh, £100,000 to go towards uh, to their development costs. So the plan is, and it's just literally gone into planning, um, is that they will be looking at a 13 megawatt solar farm on an old waste site. In reality, that's going to be enough power to generate 3,000 for 3,700 homes within Plymouth. They've actually managed to, as being one of the primary aims from this council, was that they had to increase biodiversity, which they've managed uh, to do in their planning, a 25% increase in biodiversity. They'll be saving three, nearly 3,500 tonnes of carbon per year from this project. And as I said earlier, 3.5 million pounds will be going to local projects over the next 30 years. So this is a bit of data. It's actually went to planning and we're now waiting to hear from planning to whether they're successful. So that really is a quick overview of where and how we work with communities and, and parishes. I would say that we didn't get as many applications from parish councils as we hoped for um, on the Rural Community Energy Fund. Um, I think COVID was partly to do with that. I, I was going to lots of meetings in the evening with parish councils around Devon. Um, and that, COVID, as with other things, really put the brakes on a, a, lot of, a lot of work. And even with projects that we had, those projects took a long time to develop because they couldn't do community engagement. They couldn't hold events to, to speak to their communities, et cetera, et cetera, or even get to site to look at anything as when we're on full lockdown. Um, so for us as the rural as a community as, as the energy hub communities are at the core of our delivery and particularly in, 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 in devon and, and somerset about how we take these things forward um that's really a flavor of what i wanted to talk to you today I wasn't quite sure how to pitch it um but i wanted to give an overview um, but I'm quite happy to take any questions through the chat um if, if you wish any questions to form more detail thank you very much david that was very very interesting and i'm sure 
with what's going on in the world, there will be a lot more interest in um, what projects we can work out. Any questions from the floor? We've got Mike Kelly first, please. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, good morning, David. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. I'm just turning on my video. Yeah, some interesting stuff, stuff raised. Looking at the um, uh, local energy schemes, there seems to be a little bit of a deficit in terms of the map for West Somerset and North Devon. Is there any particular reason for that? Um, so that's the first question. And I think the other question I'm particularly interested in is um, you, you talked about areas of search, and obviously that's an issue in terms of the planning agenda, particularly wind turbines. Yes. Are there any issues with planning policies that uh, you've identified any blocks to delivery of schemes? So oh, can I just start with those two questions? Yeah, fine. So the, the spread, yes, I think it's it's interesting. It's it's we do a lot of mapping uh, in our projects, and that was the first time I'd actually pinned everybody on the map. So yes, for me, it showed there's a, there is a propensity to most of the partnerships to be around that south element of, of Devon. Um, I don't really have the answer. There, there's some flippant answers I can think of that around Totnes and around those areas that, 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 sort of, <laughs> that there is that, that there were already a lot of community work going on in lots of other areas. And this was a natural progression, you know, Tre uh, Tresok, which is Totnes and uh, South Dartmoor, they've been around a very long time. And there have been amalgamations and sort of reiterations of other of other community groups. Um, so yes, we do have, you know, we, we've really only got 361 Energy up in the north of Devon. We don't have anybody on uh, around in, in your area. We have, had the, the nearest project we had for, for Exmoor really was in Wivliscombe, um, which was uh, which was around looking at uh, some new build housing there and how they could decarbonize those. Again, I, th I think that one's not gonna go through with issues of COVID and some of the changes of people pulling out. They needed a good commercial building to anchor sort of to get to take off a lot of electricity to make it work and that that developer pulled out so this is the nature of these types of projects so i don't have a clear answer for you on that but we are actively encouraging and devon community energy network which is the umbrella of the community groups um which you can find their website or i'll i'll, I'll send some links through to hazel after this um okay, are always actively looking to to engage and assist new groups coming forward so and there is a massive amount of information. One of the reasons I like working with these guys is that they're all they tend to say yes to everything and help people rather than find an excuse not to help because they want to see more groups. So you yeah, you make a very good point about there's a there's a cultural change, isn't there? I used to live in Totnes, so I know about the way that they embrace <laughs> green technology and transition yes. town, etc. So you're you're quite right. There is that sort of perception, there's a willingness to embrace that change and possibly a more culturally, what should we say, conservative uh, approach to that in the northern part of uh, the county and, and West Somerset. Um, it's a difficult one to overcome, isn't it? Okay, so, so the planning element. The second point was about the planning, yeah. Planning. There are, uh, the government basically decided to basically, let, they pulled away from land-based wind. That, that's a fact. And they made planning and local plans at that time made it very difficult. There was a propensity to refuse rather than to accept, unless you had that, unless there was embodied in the neighborhood plans, if there was one, or there was a, you could give evidence that the community were fully behind this, yeah? So we have had um, recent applications approved. So um, just on the outskirts of Bristol and Avon, they approved a new wind turbine. That was primarily because the majority of the community said yes. Without the community support, the planning and directorate would have, would have, would have cancelled it. Um, we are waiting for, uh, there's another one, which is, there's another organisation called Devon Energy Collective, which actually is a strategic board that sits over all the community groups, and they are empowered with some money from Devon County Councils to do those projects at scale, the very large projects that the individual community groups would find difficult because they don't have the knowledge or the resources to manage. Any income from anything successful would go down to those community groups. They're a non-profit organisation. Um, so they've got an application in on the outskirts of Plymouth for 65 megawatts of wind turbines. So we are waiting for some of these things to go through to planning. There is obviously rumours coming out of government with the obvious um, uh, situation in Ukraine. 
that we think that some of these things may be the, the, the pedal may be taken off the brake to allow mm. some of these projects. We still have to be very mindful, and I still think there's going to be those caveats that there has to be that community backing, yeah, that there is appropriate for certain areas and not appropriate for other areas. And I think there's always going to be this rub, especially with you know the environment that we have, and especially with you guys on Exmoor and where I live near Dartmoor. You know, there's always going to be that 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 jiggling around. Um, but um, I think some of the new local plans that we're beginning to see are beginning to zone areas. I know Team Bridge is zoning areas uh, that they would like to see applications come for for large scale solar and large scale and, and wind. So I think that it, it's easing as we go forward. Um, but planning and the current local plans don't make it easy, but these are all going through review and obviously the climate emergency strategies are now embedded in the local authorities. So this is having an impact. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, no, that's good. It's all about the area of search and getting the communities to accept it, isn't it? Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. Thanks very much. No Thank you. Our next speaker is Liz Boo. Liz. Good morning, everybody. Um, David, this, uh, <coughs> as Mike Kelly has said, has largely passed under the radar in my area in North Devon. Um, I personally am on the North Devon Council Climate Action Group. And we really have not discussed this matter at all, to my knowledge. Um, you know, it seems to be, like Mike says, all going around Plymouth. I mean, are you putting in an effort to get it more publicised in North Devon? I um, spent... And have, yes. you, have you spoken to um, Donna Sibley, who's our climate action um, yes. officer now? She, I, she I, aware I, of this? I know, I know Donna, and I have, I've spoken to Donna. Donna sits on various partnerships. So, you know, that there's... That, you, you, Without saying defensive, there's one of me, and as I was getting, <laughs> as RCEF started, um, COVID came along basically. So I was in a program of lots of outreach meetings. I was going to lots of evening meetings with parish council. Some of those did flip over onto onto Zoom. Some didn't. There was obviously people had to catch up with the technologies. So both my kids at the school eventually they caught up and they could work from home. Um, so no, and I think that's why I, I've sort of just got the okay from my bosses. I'm covering. The whole of the heart of Southwest and the whole of Dorset. That's far too much for one project manager. So <laughs> we've managed to recruit a new project manager for Dorset. So I am now 100% heart of Southwest. So, but also, you know, I've got probably the largest spatial area to cover with the whole, you know, 90% of Somerset and the thing. You know, it's taken me this long to get, you know, only from bumping into Dan at a meeting to get engagement with Exmoor National Park. Hence, I'm here today. It's about sort of making those connections. Once we know what funding we're getting from Bayes, um, and we did put in a significant push, and that's all the hubs, of one thing we wanted to see more of was community energy funding, yeah? And maybe even get rid of the rural, so some of our urban areas can work in partnership with our rural areas. Um, so we also then, during COVID, recruited a full-time programme manager for Rural Community Energy Fund, because the project managers so were trying to do three different roles. I, I think it is fair to say that we could probably can do more in engaging with a lot of other smaller groups. And I think that was my business plan that I've just submitted of what I'm doing for the next year. Touchwood, no more COVID, et cetera, et cetera, is that to get out and actually, you know, I'm starting to go to face to face meetings now to more events. It's actually start engaging more and coming to, to events like this to explain exactly what's going on. So I, if there's new funding coming out, then you are now on my mailing list. It will come through to you and go forward from there. So, but I did go to events in North Devon and Torridge and around those areas, which were aware of our funding. Thank you. Um, have, are you involved in this proposed wind farm hub, offshore wind farm hub? That's, the, um, the Celtic Array. Coming forward, hopefully. I'm, I'm not involved in it, but I sit on the LEP's uh, Strategic Energy Programme Board. So I know that they're looking at it and they're doing some research with Regen um, to look at the fit, uh, what the opportunities are for Devon and Somerset. Um, it's a long way off. It's I think it may get pushed yeah. forward a lot quicker now the Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, and I think the government, you know, I don't mind if they drop the climate element and they just go for energy security. As long as we deliver more renewable energy, I don't really mind. Um, so I think that th this they are going to relax some elements to push this forward. It, it's a very complex, you know, it, it's it all looks beautiful on pictures, if I'm honest. But having floating <laughs> offshore wind in those seas is not easy. 
yeah and also how do we get that power in um and as uh regen gave a very brief uh a sort of a sort of snapshot of some of their research today it's not just that it's about the onshore facilities that you need to support these yeah. so what do we do with apple door does it have facilities no it yeah. doesn't so how do we get we have to we have to look around at plymouth because you know we need berthing for large ships to be able to get out and support those so i am aware I think it's a long way off. It's a way so some of the tidal elements being looked at in, uh, further up the uh, up the seven. There's lots and lots of big stuff going on. If without sounding flippant, I think these things will happen once the private sector put the money in. Yeah, because it won't be from public money. I'm more focused on what we can do in <coughs> one two years. Yeah, to decarbonize communities with technology we have now and is pretty easy to deliver. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Hazel, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've picked up a couple of questions that are in the chat. Uh, I will read them out on behalf of Philip from Skillgate. Um, right. So comment. This is I'm up. I'm just going to read it as it is. Yep. So comment one is comment from a solicitor acting for a local buyer. This is at Skillgate. Um, I hope that none of these ghastly solar projects are happening in your parish. <laughs> so what is being done to address this kind of view, implication on house values? And second yeah. question, a local solar project has destroyed the local lane because of the amount of heavy traffic in the construction. None of these putting renewables in a good light. Um. I will sympathise with the construction. They do require a lot of construction heavy good. That's only for a short period of time, up to six months usually. Um, and usually they have to make good anything they have, you know, if they're taking Arctics down, they have to make good as part of their contract. Um, as for a element about affecting house prices, uh, that that's, I think, an emotive personal view and I'm probably not really the best place for me to give that view today. <laughs> I think it could swing either way. I know that, uh, yeah. Got another question from um, Young Voices with Mr. Silverlock. Your mic's off. Uh, you got your mic. That's better. <laughs> now he's off again. Switch your mic on, Liz, please. Thank you. I did three times. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Exmoor Young Voices is a charity set up by the, initiated by the National Park seven years ago. Um, all of us got their own Young People's Committee and so on. And there's about 960 of them and they've got a lot of projects. The most important one today is their innovative self-build project. Um, which is the only affordable option now for home ownership by uh, young people on Exmoor. Yeah. Um, and uh, they've got money, loans and grants. They've got sites, thanks to the park and planning support, um, and a very good professional advisor. You can find out more on the EYV website. Um, but the most important thing is, of course, that self-build is carbon negative. Is that the right phrase? Um, uh, it, it produces good things rather yes. than bad things. Okay. Carbon neutral. Yes. And what we'd good like point. to know is, can will you join us in partnership? Um, I'm happy to look at the project. Um, if you, and again, a lot of my work isn't just sort of doing project mandates, go working through procurement, legal documents. Um, I'm very clear with my boss. It's about engaging and 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 using the technical knowledge I have to assist projects, even if it isn't an official project. Um, to give that advice at the early stage, you know, as we sort of call it, as a critical friend, and we and that's sort of 50, 60 percent of my role. I'm more than happy. Uh, we have solar experts, we have energy experts to guide you. If it becomes a project and you want to say we need some assistance with this, then I, I can explain off flight how you do that. But more than happy to get involved and and to have a look. And I'm looking for any excuse to get out of my house, if I'm honest. So to come and look at something would be fantastic. <laughs> Actually, get out on site, which I'm getting. <laughs> Well, apologies, you couldn't, apologies, you're hearing from an old person, not a young person, but no. they can't they can't make daytime meetings because they're at work. I completely understand. My wife's a GP and she's she's got a whole youth mental health forum and, and spends a lot of her time working with sort of under 18 year olds in Columpton. So, yeah, it's uh, should be part of, as I say, it's on my community energy partnerships. Where are the young people? 
you know it's uh we need that representation on here as well because they're the future but uh i will have a look i'll have a look on the, is it on the on the national park website uh, no x more young voices but there is a link on the park website to all of theirs and there's a special uh, section on self build thank you very much thank Dave. you thank you very much uh, i've got one last question for you um david and it's from Bill Cash. Bill? Oh, hello. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Gash. I'm a trustee of the Exmoor Society, and I'm representing Rachel Thomas, who unfortunately can't be with you today. Um, uh, she has asked me to quickly flag our um, spring conference, which takes place every year on the 22nd of April at Porlock, and the challenge of change is the theme. Um, so I would encourage people to check the new website for the Exmoor Society, and further details of that can be obtained after you want from, the, from me directly. Um, my question is really, I'm very impressed by everything David has shared. I'm very interested in all the topics that he's covered and the case studies or examples provided. It doesn't seem like enough. I don't think that you know a team of five covering an area uh, and population that he has asked to do is really enough. Um, and I wondered whether he is already talking to people uh, higher up, should we say, within government uh, and within the, the ministry or the department he's referred to about getting extra funding just to help them get a bigger team and do more because we've got COP26 last yeah. year and now we have everything that's falling out from the Ukraine conflict, particularly fuel inflation, which is going to hit everybody in the southwest who isn't on, even those on electricity, obviously, uh, those people on gas supplies, but a lot of homes and other buildings, my schools in Dalton, for example, rely on oil, and the cost of that is rocketing and will continue to rocket um, through the next few years. So um, any thoughts, really, David, about how we can get the whole programme that you've been promoting so well here um, and doing good work to many more communities and homes and public sector bodies as well? It's a difficult question uh, in the fact of that, you know, we are limited by funding on how many people we can have. Um, we are trying to encourage our local authorities to take on more technical resource. Unfortunately, it's not a, it's not a statutory function of local authority delivery. So it's, you know, as we've got with one of our quite large local unitaries is that because of budgetary cuts, the first people going are all their climate teams and all their analysts, all the, all the people that are, they've managed to garner and get that knowledge in-house. There is a propensity with this current government, I would say that, uh, and I would say that the, the propensity to sort of be very, very wary of risk and governance and all those elements within local authorities now and, and in government is that they'd much rather pay an external consultant to give them advice rather than have that knowledge in-house. We find it completely potty. Um, and, I, you know, I do four days for the hub and I have my own private consultancy and it seems no point that these private consultancies are being paid exorbitant amounts of money to then take that knowledge away rather than keep that knowledge in house. The other factor is, is that we're finding it incredibly difficult to recruit the right technical skills um, to be able to fill gaps we have. So to getting somebody who is proficient around certain technology and having that deep uh, technical knowledge of how to deliver it, not what it looks like on a pretty picture, but how you go from that call to action to actually sticking it in the ground. And it's a massively complex project to get that to happen, There's lots of pitfalls. You know, those those are coming more and more rare, and we're finding it very difficult. We've got job adverts that have been there for a year and no takers. Uh, David, if I may just ask yeah. one supplementary question, if Mr. Chairman's so, happy. So I think what a number of examples, the Plymouth example is around yeah. in building a solar array and so on, and that's going to be costly. You know, the payback time can quite try, drawn out. I'm talking about issues that people can take into their own hands yes. through retrofitting and improving the heat efficiency of the homes or the buildings that they're responsible for um, and making access to the knowledge, the skills, uh, the advice that you've described far more widespread. Um, because I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Les Silverlock's example about the sort of Exmoor Young voice, um, Voices is a classic example of where we like to basically try and crack on and solve things ourselves, as you know, yeah. in this part of the world. And I think this is a case of, you know, if you're strapped for resources, hand over what you have to, you know, push that down to more community and more community level, and we can crack on and <laughs> case of sort of give us the tools and we'll finish the job, if you like. 
more than happy to. If, if, if you could uh, create a, a community energy partnership uh, and become Good. a Bencom or a CIC, um, I, I'm happy to, to guide you to Community Energy England so you can download all the legal documents, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, and also some of our more active partnerships are more than happy to hold you out. You know, it, it, it's, you know, for me personally, it, it's, you know, the way forward to, to, to get certain actions down at that low, at that lower level. So a lot of our community groups do the LEAP program, which is is going in and working with their communities for, for simple energy efficiency measures like LEDs by sort of looking at their controls to make sure they're set up correctly, looking at their radiators and finding, you know, new radiators so they're more efficient. We're all quite low level, relatively inexpensive measures that can make a fundamental difference. And at the same time, they are developing large scale solar farms that you know, are going to have, I think, you know, the, the Plymouth Energy Community Solar Farm actually has a six year payback of their capital. So, and that's going to be raised through a, a large cap, uh, share bid uh, in Plymouth, uh, hopefully early next year. So all these things, and, it, and it's, you know, I, I, one of my main things is to push to have more community energy partnerships, ideally in partnership with their town and parish councils and their local authority, because they all have a role to play to deliver. And without with that with one or two people not being at that table it makes it a lot more difficult as we found uh, to our experience um if a local authority isn't on board then it makes it very difficult for that community energy group to deliver in isolation so it's about partnership to deliver technical I, uh, challenging projects th thank you for your answer david i, I just say we have the added sort of uh, uh, dimension to be inside the Exmoor National Park in Dulberton, for example, um, where I'm speaking from today. So, yeah. um, but I'd certainly want to take you up on your offer. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Happy to speak offline. Thank you very much. I've got two more questions and then we'll right. uh, that, that popped up and I'll then bring this discussion to an end. Um, yep. Alan Collins. Alan. Well, thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Can you, um, am I on? Yes. Can, yep. can you hear me? Oh, David, the projects you talk, you've been talking about are quite large. Yep. Villages, by definition, are quite small. Yes. What's the smallest project you would consider? Oh, under, under the Rural Community Energy Fund, the smallest project was defined as being more than one building. Yeah. So what 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 the oh, government really? didn't want was was small five ten kilowatt roof mounted solar projects on on village halls yeah they did a lot of that under their last program uh, under what i think it was called rap rap um so they were looking that if you were going to have say a school and the village hall working together the primary school next to each other and they were going to put on one of the roofs more significant solar or put a very small say i don't know 30 30 kilowatt ground mounted array in between them yeah that would be illegible yeah somebody putting a air source or quite a large ground source heat pump in that would also heat both buildings that would be illegible yeah so we did go try and do some quite small projects uh, in, in that terms um so that that's where we are so so small by definition for bays was more than two buildings um so they didn't want to do singular buildings that was their thing so um but there are you know, quite a lot of what I call quite big projects going on in village urban area, in village areas at the moment. I think down in Cornwall, Stithians, there's uh, six million pounds uh, as the tail end of the ERDF funding, European funding, where Kenza are working, at, who are a heat, ground source heat pump company, are working in partnership with the council and installing 500 ground source heat pumps, primarily into new build and all the all the houses on oil, yeah, in that area because they're off grid, yeah, um, and they're they're looking at supplying heat for the socially fuel poor in that area for 100 pounds flat fee a year up to 400 pounds for the private residences yes there's a lot of public money in there you know significant amount of public money but to trial these things and get the data going and all that sort of thing and um needs to be done to decarbonize some of our as, as we battle with bays a lot because a lot of policies we know is urban centric yeah and all looks very good on paper for urban areas but when you take it down to a village scale or rural scale it makes it a lot more difficult to deliver some of the, the wishes of our government. So completely take on board. Anna, um, and yes, we are more than happy to look at smaller scale projects for you. Thank you very much. Uh, and our last question comes from Vivian White. Vivian. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Um, uh, 
you, you've you've dealt in your last two answers um, with 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 what I wanted most to raise with you, but I just want to underline once again that what you, the, the people you're speaking to now are parish councils from small and 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 not only small but poor communities. So that whilst it's interesting to hear what you've done in Plymouth, and we respect you for it, and whilst we we're interested to, to know what what what's happened down in a in in a big big spend down in Cornwall. I want. I just wanted to to ask you to to pitch to us in small communities. My question, therefore, is: What do you expect of us? We're parishes on Exmoor. Uh, we're in we're in a place which is beautiful, but planning tightly, planning controlled. We're pretty pr pretty poor incomes per 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 head. What do you want of us? Oh, the world. No. Uh <laughs> I think yeah, I, I'm going back after this meeting to engage with the national park again because I think. You know, the same way as we, we haven't had a lot of traction with Dartmoor National Park and some of the communities there. I, I fully I know Exmoor very well. Um, I've got very good friends who live on Exmoor. I know Delverton nearly bought a house in Delverton last year. Um, so I understand, same as I understand Dartmoor, and I've lived down here for nearly 40 years now. So it is something that I am pushing internally that, you know, even with some of our programmes, they look great for Exeter, uh, for like retrofit programmes of decarbonising domestic housing. They look great in Exeter and Plymouth because... A, the public sector like those because they're all bunched together and also the private sector like it who are delivering it and installing because it reduces their costs. They're not driving 10 miles in between each, each house. So we, the government is aware whether they're doing enough is another question. Um, but what I want from Exmoor is, is, is seeing <coughs> that power of, of grouping. And you have this forum where I'm assuming other there are parish councils represented from all over Exmoor. Yes. Um, to work in partnership i feel i have some work to do with the with the national park to say how are you going to enable yeah you know standing outside and saying no as, as we're trying to engage with dartmoor saying no renewables no this no solar on people's buildings etc etc really doesn't help um we have to all move forward english heritage are moving forward the the, the national trust are beginning to move forward um and, and recognizing their role in assisting the, the, the climate uh, actions towards climate change and also i think now decarbonizing or putting non-fossil fuels into people's buildings a bit of solar is going to reduce their fuel bills and it's a bit of a no-brainer now of, of fuel poverty so how are we going to do that i think it does need some enabling actions from a local authority or, or an outside body i think it needs a little bit of funding and i'm saying a lot um you know in, in the low thousands to help these groups come together i can assist them by signposting them people to facilitators and how to do it and i don't mind putting a bit of my time in to come to meetings and facilitate how to set these things up and how to progress as you go forward but the, the power is in your hands to really shape how you want to see your local communities go forward around decarbonisation. Um, and I think people in my position have that chance to critically assist bodies to assist them and, and see the benefit. It, it, it's a game. I've got to show them the benefit for them. Yeah. And there's not a lot of climate action going on on Exmoor. There are some bits, but not as much in other areas. And we like to see that become a little bit more uniform and not just down in the south of the county. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more, however. Long answer to your question, but um, thank, you for say, answer. thank you for I'm coming on the same page. Thank, thank you. you for your answer and thank you for coming to talk to us. No problem at all. Yes. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I was going to make that the last question, but Penny, <laughs> uh, this <laughs> will need to be the last question. Good yeah. job, the guy for a WPD didn't turn up, didn't it? Um, <laughs> Okay, all very interesting. So how do we get you for a small parish council to come and see what you can do for us? If you want to invite me to a parish council meeting, I'm more than happy. If you send me an invite that you've got a parish council meeting, you'd like me to come and speak to you. I am more than happy to come and speak to you. Hazel, have I got contact? We will, we will make sure that uh, David's contact details are on the uh, minutes of this yep. meeting and on the National Park. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And now just to prove that the amount of planning that goes into Hazel putting this uh, agenda together, we're going to go from making energy, generating energy to using energy. So we'll go to item six, which is the family friendly cycle ride. 
with Dan Burnett, uh, Dan Burnett and Sarah Edwards. I don't know who wish to speak first, but you're welcome to start. Dan? Dan, you're on mute. Do you want to yes, go first? Yes, I know. I know. Yes, I'll go first. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'll just say a few words and then I'll, I'll let Sarah get on with the uh, the more interesting things. But um, I think most of you know me, but for those who don't, Dan Barnett, Access and Recreation Manager for Exmoor National Park Authority. Um, and by way of a bit of, a bit, bit of background on this one, the National Park Authority agreed some years ago to do some work to explore opportunities for more family friendly cycling within or near to the National Park. Um, you know, we know Exmoor already has lots of interest for cycling enthusiasts, but the focus of this work is around families and leisure cyclists who aren't necessarily very fit or confident on a bike and for whom there aren't <coughs> currently many opportunities um, here. And this idea is generally well supported, essentially because of the opportunity to encourage more younger visitors to enjoy Exmoor and the associated economic benefits for local businesses. and. You know, our evidence, uh, even with the, the COVID impact, can, you know, shows a steady decline in younger visitors, uh, which is a concern uh, to a lot of us. So we agreed to carry out a feasibility study and set about that in back in 2019. Feels like a different world. Uh, and it's, you know, a substantial and quite specialist bit of work. So we needed to get some help in and the Steam Coast Trail project team expressed an interest. And whilst the Steam Coast Trail, some of you may know it, uh, has a focus outside the National Park between um, Minehead and I know I always get this wrong, Sarah, so I apologise. Uh, watch it. Uh, Sarah will correct me in a minute. Uh, they had some project officer capacity and all the right skills and experience and contacts to help us with this bit of work. So we've been really pleased to have them on board. Um, now, originally, we hoped to complete the, the pre-public consultation phase in around 12 months, but, you know, coronavirus pandemic and lots of other things have caused a lot of delay however i'm pleased that we've now completed the substantial initial work and we're ready to begin that wider public consultation phase um, so i'm going to hand over to sarah now from the steam coast trail team who's led on this piece of work and she can explain more about where we are with it i'll also mention before sarah takes off that luke hother is also joined joined us i believe is is in is around um and join the meeting he's from the southwest lakes trust uh you know managing wimmerball uh lake so he's also available here should anyone wish to ask him a question thanks thanks oh, dan yeah hi, that's all right yeah thanks dan you were very close um the Stinkos Trail is working to create a network of cycle routes between Minehead and Williton, so very close. But yeah, hello everyone and thanks for taking the time to hear about the project today. Um, as Dan mentioned, um, we've predicted huge economic benefits that could come from the development of these routes. But something I'm really keen to highlight before I show you the work is the impact that these family friendly cycle routes could also have on the local com communities, especially for helping younger generation foster an appreciation for outdoor activities. So when I started working for the Steam Coast Trail back in 2018, I hadn't really cycled since I left Bristol in 2009, where I, I, I used to cycle a lot. I carried a 13 mile commute several times a week on a bike, but I live in Watchit and those that know the A39, it's quite frankly terrifying for cycling. And the winding B roads are also incredibly steep with really poor visibility. So when I started with the Steam Coast Trail, I, I started using my old faithful bike to inspect the Steam Coast Trail paths to check for, for safety and that sort of thing. And they have traffic free paths that, and one's alongside a beach and the other one's through really beautiful countryside. And I'd often find myself grinning at the views and just having a really lovely time being away from the traffic and, and falling back in love with cycling, to be honest. So I still do oversee the development of the Steam Coast Trail, but I'm now also project manager for active travel for Somerset Western Taunton Council. And I'm currently working on a multi-million pound cycle infrastructure project for Taunton Town Centre, as well as feasibility work for other routes throughout the district. So with these projects, I really don't just want to add infrastructure. <clears throat> I want to come up with ways that we can address misconceptions and overcome conflict between different path users and change people's feelings and towards cycling and their acceptance of cycling more generally. I want my kids to think of cycling not, uh, you know, it's just a normal way for people to get around or, or that it could just be for fun. I don't want them to think cycling is just a sport for super fit people in really expensive lycra. 
Um, but if, if we don't provide safe and accessible and preferably traffic free places for people to cycle, then how are our current roads and hills going to convince anybody that cycling could be for them and their families? So these rural routes that you're about to see, they will provide places for tourists and local people to enjoy cycling and being outdoors and hopefully also helping to shift the culture away from thinking that cycling is just for cyclists only. They'll offer huge economic benefits from, from more cycle tourism, and that's a subject I could talk about for hours, but I will spare you. Um, and they could encourage younger people to get their, and, and young and families to get outside and enjoy themselves on Exmoor. OK, so I've made a video for the public consultation that we're moving to very soon. Um, you're about to get the international premiere of the video. It's, it's a little bit long. It's about eight and a half minutes. Believe me, I tried to get it down a bit more, um, but I couldn't. And then we'll welcome your questions afterwards. So I really hope you can hear this video. Can someone please let me know if you can't? I'll let you know, Sarah. Thank you. Can you all see that? Family friendly cycling. That's public. the one. Yep. OK, all right. I can't hear anything. Can anyone no, else? No, I can't uh, hear anything. Oh, oh, that was something I was worried about. One sec. Let me see if I go on mute if it helps. No, can't hear it. I'm very sorry. I was worried about this. Oh. Let me try changing screens. Sorry, folks. I have shown videos on this before and they've been fine. OK. Try sharing the video, share in your play the video on your screen and then share the screen to the network. That might yeah. work. I will try this one. Let's try now. I've gone down to one screen. This may help. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what a video card is. can see it but can't hear it. I'm terribly sorry. Do you want me to try, Sarah? And, Do you want um, to give it a try, Dan? I'm really sorry, folks. Yeah. I'll keep... Yeah, okay. thank you. I could try it in my browser. Well, just let me try this as I've got it okay. ready to go. And then, um, I'll stop sharing and see what I can do. I'm very sorry about that. So has my version taken over the screen? Yep, yep, you can see that. Hello, my name is Sarah. You've got it, but it's very quiet. Put the volume up. Too quiet, I think. Too quiet. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've got an idea. We, I could talk over a video. It may mean the timing's a bit ropey, but we can try it. Sorry, folks. Right, Dan. I'll um take control of the screen, and then I can uh, pause it if I'm not as fast as my self-talking. Should we give it a try that way? Okay. So, yeah, this is the public consultation version of the video um, and it's um, it's going to be on the Exmoor National Park website and it's going to encourage people to take a survey at the end of it as well. So the survey isn't quite live yet, so please don't take that and go away and try and find it. It will be live very soon. So we've got this work to a stage where we want to consult more widely. So I've got quite a lot of feedback from somebody. Is, is everyone on mute? I can hear myself echoed. Thank you. Oh no, still got it. So as we've mentioned, we've got this work to a stage where we want to consult more widely. Um, so if you want to have your say on the routes, there are three things that you can do. So firstly, um, it's watching this video and that'll give an overview of the routes. And then secondly, if you want a more detailed information, then you can have a look at the report of the work that'll be on the Exmoor website as well. And then thirdly, we're welcoming feedback via a survey link that will also be on the website. So why did we decide to carry out this work? Well, Sarah, do you want to yeah. share the video as well? Because at Gosh. the moment, I don't think we can see the video. This is catastrophic, isn't it? You got it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got it now? Great. Yeah. OK, let's try again. OK, so why did we decide to start this work? In terms of visitor numbers to Exmoor, the young families demographic, which is um, age 24 to 45 year olds has almost halved in the last 10 years 
and a number of other cycle trails in the southwest, such as the Steam Coast Trail and the Breen Down Way and the Tarka Trail. They've been really successful in addressing this and encouraging more young families to the national park. And they're usually very cost effective ways to do so with benefit to cost ratios of around seven to one. So there's also the government's gear change document, which is um, a bold vision for encouraging more cycling in, in around the UK. Um, there's also the National Park's own climate emergency targets to, and purpose to promote enjoyment. So before we look at the routes, it's important to highlight the key considerations that we use to assess them. The brief was to try and find easy to use routes that are safe and suitable for a broad range of cyclists and try to ensure the benefits of this project are distributed throughout the National Park. They should have a net positive impact on landscape and nature, along with local economic benefits. They should, uh, if possible, provide sustainable travel options for local communities and accommodate walking, powered wheelchairs and horse riding. To this end, we selected an inland route around Wimberbull Lake and a coastal route from Minehead to Porlock Weir via Bossington. Unfortunately, whilst a good route between Minehead and Bossington was considered feasible, we couldn't obtain full landowner agreement and this section has had to be dropped at a late stage. So this video is instead going to just show the second section from Bossington to Porlock Weir and the Wimberbull route only. The inland route around Wimberbull Lake is approximately nine miles long. And the second part of the coastal route totals four and a half kilometres, which is about three miles. We believe these routes are suitable for families with reasonably fit and bike confident children of about eight years plus. There's a potential alternative route from Porlock, um, from Porlock Marsh to Porlock, which is completely traffic free and flat and therefore suitable for even younger children. OK, now this will take us into taking a look at the routes. Here is an overview of the second part of the coastal route. As you can see, it crosses the Porlock Marsh, which is a site of special scientific interest. It generally follows the line of the coast path. There are a few sections here that already have a suitable path surface, but in other sections to prevent excessive mud, we're going to need to add compacted aggregate surface, not dissimilar to the one you can see here, which is at the Marsh Boardwalk. But in terms of safety and accessibility, any path improvements will also make access easier for people using wheelchairs and mobility equipment and pushchairs as well. Here we have a proposed alternative route into Porlock on Spark Hayes Lane, which provide an entirely traffic free and very level section for uh, would be suitable for families with really young children. We then carried out a tidal assessment as well here to understand the impact better. That's in the report if you wanted to have a look there as well. And yes, it is a big constraint here, but it is safely manageable. The main route then crosses over the Hawkham stream, and that will either be via a new bridge or a boardwalk if the National Trust proposal to re-wet the meadow is successful. Then we head beyond Decoy Linhay, and there's already a wide, well-surfaced ag um, aggregate path there. You can see in that image. This now takes us to the last section of the route, on to Porlock Weir. We assessed three options for this part of the route, and this one here on the road was deemed to be the most viable due to landowner permissions and the practicalities of the Shingle Ridge. So the route follows the footpath up from the marsh. Um, you can see in that path that it needs some minor surface improvements here and there. But then it joins the B3225, where there's some unavoidable height gain. Um, there's also a little restricted visibility through West Porlock there. But we've begun a consultation with Somerset County Council Highways to consider a review of the speed limit on this section to improve safety. The route then passes a link to the National Cycle Network Route 51 there and then continues on a straight road. It's got good visibility into Porlock Weir. So now we'll zoom on over to Wimberbull Lake and take a look at that route. Hope it's not making everyone too dizzy. There we go. OK, so starting by the campsite and cafe, we propose to encourage people to use this route in a one way anti clockwise direction. There will there'll be the additions of speed, reducing features where necessary um, just to maximise safety. The route starts off following the existing cycle path along to the dam. And then it heads up a short steep section that's on tarmac. Um, it follows the bridle way up there. The lakeside route was assessed, but it's unfortunately not feasible. That's explained in the report. This next bit is where we'd like to create um, and promote an additional access point for the route that goes to Haddon Hill Car Park. Then back to the main route, it 
it continues through Deer Park and there's already a lovely wide well surfaced track there with good visibility. Um, heads on up through the woods. Um, there will be some surface improvements on the bridleway um, in Upton Cleave Woods here. You can see from this image that it can get really muddy there. So we would need to add uh, an aggregate surface that was suitable for occasional forestry extraction here. Then down on a bit, we've proposed near Pepperpot Castle to route through a section of trees with a new link path that would avoid the road. You can see the outline design of the path there. Again, that will be explored with conservation considerations fully in mind. The route descends quite steeply down, but there's quite a wide track there with good visibility, and then it heads down towards the river. Um, there's already, you can see in that image, an existing stone bridge. It can get really slippery there. So we propose to construct a new cycle friendly timber bridge alongside it um, so people can cross the river safely. The next section heads up through the lovely West Hill Wood, where some surface and drainage repairs will be necessary. Um, there's one steeper section in the wood that you can see in that image there, but again, it's wide and there's good surface and it's not too long. After the wood, the route travels alongside the lake, and then in some places, there's quite a steep crossfall. So for that reason, in some sections here, we can only achieve a width of 1.5 metres in places, but we do feel that that can safely accommodate cyclists and walkers with passing places to improve convenient shared use, um, and there could be some speed reducing features as well where necessary. This now takes us on to the only section of the road that's the route that's unavoidably on a public road. So this is Rugs Hill Road. It's straight and it has good visibility and relatively low volume of traffic. So it is deemed suitably safe for um, young children, especially if we were to add an advisory cycle lane, um, which you can see in that image there, just an example of one. We need some additional signage as well to warn motorists of the presence of cyclists. After Rugs Hill, the route comes to Besson Bridge, um, where again, an advisory cycle lane could be added on the south side of the carriageway to provide a one-way cycle lane. Then after Besson Bridge, we wanted to minimise the on-road as much as possible. So we've looked to create a new path that would wind around the trees there on the riverside bank. The route then rejoins the existing path back towards the activity centre, and there's already adequate width and surfacing there. And that's it. That's the summary of the route. So I will end the video there. And yeah, there will be the link for people to um, to find and give their feedback on the survey. So I'll stop sharing. Sorry about those technical issues again. Um, but yeah, really welcome any questions and feedback. All right. Thanks, um, Sarah. And just to mention that um, uh, the next steps really for us are to do a media release. Um, to allow public access to the to that presentation and, and the report and promote the public survey uh we'll we, we're planning to hold two drop-in days also possibly probably porlock and dulverton and after that process which is going to take quite a few weeks uh we'll take stock of the results and then report back to our members and and anyone any other stakeholders um you know and um you know, the, just to mention the survey, you know, we'll try and capture people's views on these proposals, but also ask for other ideas and comments in general uh, about cycling on Exmoor. So there's multiple benefits, hopefully, from the survey. Thanks. Thank you very much. We've got the uh, first question from Andy Mill. Andy. Yes. Uh, hello, Sarah. Hello, Dan. Um, I'm the district council for, for Porlock. And I've also been on the parish council there, or that I certainly attend and have close linkages with them. Uh, and we were totally unaware of the cycle path proposals. I think they are excellent and I'm a keen, enthusiastic cyclist myself. Uh, and I'm just uh, staggered that all this work has been going on. And firstly, myself as a district councillor was completely unaware and on Exmoor National Park. And then secondly, uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, the parish councillors never raised this ever and would be very interested in all this. And I'm a bit worried about the, unless I'm completely um, lacking knowledge here, uh, surprised that we haven't been talked to or kept up to date at least with these proposals, which I think are brilliant, don't get me wrong, but I am surprised that all this work has been taking place without apparent, certainly my knowledge or the parish councils. 
Can I can I respond and give Sarah a break on that one? Because uh, it's probably sits with me, really. The difficulty has been all along with this one is about the sensitivity of the landowner consultations. Um, so we've always been in this difficult situation of like, how much do we open it out? And at what point do we open it out without potentially um, insulting or um, upsetting the landowners involved? Um, now, we desperately want to talk to Porlock um, and other parish councils about this and before this goes public I you know the plan was to come and meet with you specifically um it's just the way timings have fallen I'm afraid that we've needed to do this first and you're some of you are finding out about it this way so look my apologies I'm, I'm pleased that you're positive about the project at least so that's that's uh, really good to know and very happy to come and talk to you about it and, uh, and apologies that it's not been done sooner and along the way Yes, thanks, Dana. I, I, I look forward to a, a, a positive conversation. Yeah, good. Thank you. I can also add on to that. Yeah, the way that the Steam Coast Trail has worked has been it been a similar way that it and for these these proposals, they are it's been feasibility work and it's by no means a, a done deal and all gonna go ploughing ahead without any consultation. This is very much like this is the work we've come up with and what we think could work. What do you think? Got any feedback? How? Do, what else do you think? Do you have any other suggestions? As Dan mentioned, we're going to be really welcoming of that. So it's by no means sort of a big reveal and, you know, it's going to then be all delivered. So we're really welcoming of feedback and, and sharing it with everybody. Next question is Philip Beavis from Schoolgate. Yes, hello. Thank you for the two, for the presentations of the two suggestions. Um, just one slightly technical point. You you show these sort of cycle lanes along a main road. Um, enforceable on Exmoor, I've got my doubts. My what could I suggest that you look into the new signage that's come up, which prioritises pedestrians and then cycles and then cars, because that's an educational process rather than putting lanes which aren't going to be um you, you can't implement those lanes because people along the sections i know it quite well will just park their cars and therefore the cycle cycle lane will actually be, be completely blocked so i don't know if you know what i'm talking about but there's these new signs that come out where you've got a, a pedestrian in very large and then a, a smaller bicycle and then a tiny car which i think probably you know for Exmoor would actually be quite a good introduction to a new signage and help people understand that. And then um, just a complete sidetrack. Are you aware of the remains of the Studley Bridge still awaiting to be put and turned into a cycle path in Exbridge? I, I'm um, not, no. So the, there's a, there was a, a Sustrans proposal a long time ago okay um but there are still the the girders for the main bridge sitting in a lay-by between bampton and tiverton awaiting to be put in to create basically um and that would be a fantastic project but a um at least a very short cycle lane or cycle track between exbridge and dulverton that's all uh, thank you very much now I'd love to speak to come back to you and speak to you more about that, please, if I can get a chance. I'm sure Sarah would as well, because I'm not aware of that project at all. Okay. Yes, I'd like to. Yeah. And about the, the signage, were you referring to quiet lanes? Brown signs that should have sort of show the hierarchy of road users? N no, no I've seen them in permitted. I've seen them in central London actually now. Okay. Yeah. So they're on they're on main routes. Yeah. So the the cycle lanes and I also presume you're referring to around Rugs Hill Road and Besson Bridge around Wimbledon Lake. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So we have been doing this with consultation from County Council Highways as well, and so we've been going on their guidance. And the idea of the advisory cycle lane that it is just that it is an advisory cycle lane. It's not mandatory. It won't be a solid white line. It's it's advisory. So if it's needed on Besson Bridge, for example, because you know in high seasons the pavement can become extremely busy with people. Right. So if it's necessary, then people could choose to take that 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 path because also we are promoting this route in a one-way direction as well for safety so it would only need to narrow the carriageway with an advisory cycle lane just one one side as well mm. so um yeah these proposals have very much been guided by um a, advice from somerset county council highways as well but yeah okay. i'll look into the signage for thank the you. shared lanes okay thank you thank you thank you next question from penny weber penny Uh, 
I've got it now. No, it was about the um, not knowing of the of the cycle trail going across. It actually was they came and saw us, uh, Andy. I think I've just messaged you um, because I'm quite excited about it myself. There is somebody talking or something. Sorry, I don't know who it is. Um, but I didn't know that it's been shelved, and I'd really like to know if that's because of the National Trust. Are you allowed to tell me that? Uh, I can tell you it's not because of the National Trust, but I, I probably can't say very much about it. I'm happy to uh -huh. talk to you, um, Penny, anyway, though, at some point. I would have soon. loved that to happen. would have loved that to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. You take your life in your hands going on the A39 from here. <laughs> anyway, talk to you yeah. later. Thank you. Mike, sorry, I had to mute you. I've got two questions left. The first one from Nick. Yes, Nick good Prince. morning. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, the, if I remember rightly, this um, proposal came up, particularly around the lakes, came up at the National Park meeting in the past, just re yes. fairly recently. One of the concerns that was raised there was certainly about, certainly around the park, around the, the lake itself, is how do you, you cope with people that are actually walking? Because that's quite a, um, a family um, affair, people walking along those paths and things like this. That came up previously and there was a major concern about that. And I thought you took that on board. Clearly, I'm concerned. I mean, I, I actually walk my dogs around there as well at times, but I know there's people with small children that walk along there. And one concern about cyclists, though I'm not against cycling by any means, but I know that, you know, we get them through Burridge Wood, uh, even though it's a footpath, people just whip along very fast. It's, it's effectively, cyclists can be as bad as horse riders. In other words, horses are there, but they're not so much controlled. Cyclists are more controlled, but they're quiet. So they whip around the corner, quite high speed, and you get a little child there. I'm just concerned, how do you address this issue? Because this is a very important issue that tends to be pushed off to one side and ignored. It has been brought up at the National Park uh, Authority meeting, and I know uh, I'm pretty certain that uh, Dan was aware of this as well. So can I ask that question? How is that that considered? <laughs> Yes, of course. No, I mean, I think safety is probably the most important issue. And when you're encouraging any outdoor activity, there's going to be a level of risk. But I think that by you, you've sort of hit the nail on the head there, Councillor Thwaites, that there are cyclists around Wimbledon Lake already. So what we're doing is we're assessing how we can make that even safer or a lot safer than it currently is. So any sections where there may not be good visibility, we could address with some speed slowing measures on the approach to that. Um, we can look to the signage. We could look to just in, encouraging responsible shared use. And just widening any paths and providing passing places if we're going to anticipate there may be any safety issues and conflicts there. So we're going and to also, put cycle bumps up there, are we? Not cycle As bumps, no, <laughs> no, no, we wouldn't put them. No, no metal chicane gates or anything like that. It would all be designed very sympathetically towards the environment. So because this is all to assess where where there may be that conflict and how we can minimise it. My understanding is that one of the discussions took place was about the. I say the other side of, of the, the Wimble Lake, where at the moment it is very uh, muddy, um, difficult to pass even as a pedestrian. I thought that was one of the, the um, um, if you like, the, the hiccups that were uh, to, to that side. The discussion I understood was, well, we're going to do one side, uh, I hate to say the south side, but one side of the brick, one side where it's quite clear footpath at the present time on the other side where it was going to be um, obviously muddy and difficult to do but that was going to be left from what I hear it, that's not the case anymore is that right? Do you mean the the muddy side is the the east side of Wimbledon Lake? Uh, yeah, well um, it just depends which way you're coming from. <laughs> it depends on which, which way you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. side over here which is tend to be um, Less use, if I can put it that way, for that's where the best fishing is. Sorry, that's where the best fishing is. 
Well, yeah, absolutely. More, not if you're going to get a lot of cyclists going along. It's not no, good. We've considered exactly. that. We've thought about how we've thought about the reach that we need for for fly rods and everything like that. We have. We wouldn't ever want to introduce a conflict there either. So we want to mitigate that wherever possible. So this route is proposed that we are making um, a route going all the way around the lake, and that we would be addressing the muddy sections with um, some aggregate surfacing, perhaps that would be course done with conservation and landscape in mind. Um, we're also looking at ecology where we can do that safely. We know there are some areas for the butterflies that we want to protect and you know so ecology is very much going to be part of that as well. So yeah it is just addressing those sections that may not be as well used but cyclists probably still do use them and just to make them safer and just a bit more usable for, for all path users though. It just sounds, I hate to sorry come back, but it just sounds a very expensive exercise and um, you know, I, I, I'm quite happy with cyclists to go on different things, but I'm aware of um, the concern that's expressed on the basis of that. And certainly I would be concerned about um, manipulating the, the uh, which is effectively the countryside currently, which is, you know, what we like to do. Can I just uh, come in, Sarah, do you mind? Mm, of course. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, the... Just to remind us all, the idea here is to make a proposal and then do a consultation. So this is the consultation. Um, so if those are the strong views that come back, then you know that's that's the point at which the proposal should be altered or dropped or you know whatever is decided for the future. Um, and that's what was agreed by authority that we would go forward with this proposal for cons for public consultation uh, and then get all the viewpoints on board. I would query that because at the meeting we had that there was the discussion was against going around the other side of the lake and um, that was my understanding of what the authorities vision or view was at the time um but now obviously you're going ahead with a uh, an external consultant uh, um consultation which is slightly different to what i understood but yeah we're, we're, we're obviously see yeah i mean it's, it's you know um it, i know it was a little while ago but it was pretty clear uh, you know at the time and, and it was all recorded in the notes carefully to make sure that and, and signed off so i'm pretty confident that what we're doing is what was approved by authority um and and as you say you know there are there are lots of positive views and concerns out there and the idea is to bring all those in understand them fully um you know before we decide what to do next we have got uh, luke here as well i don't know if luke how the uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Luke, but whether Luke wants to say anything from Southwest Lake Trust, who are the landowner on that section and most of this route. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just, uh, I guess, the people um, who are visiting the lake, they're cycling around the lake already. Uh, and we're looking to, uh, this would be a good way to moderate and make safe uh, the people that are going, um, using the place. You know, uh, one of our charitable objectives is to try and encourage people to engage with outdoor space um, in and in, in forms of many forms of exercise as many as possible. And with the um, technological uh, advances with e-bikes, especially, you know, that's making it very accessible for very for people of all ages, walks of life, um, to to get outside. Um, Yes, there would be some infrastructure that would need to be put in place, but um, we are very keen to make it uh, sustainable and also in 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 line with the the area that we are uh, we've got. We've got many talented and skilled people within our team, um, from ecologists um, that that can advise and make it uh, very in keeping with the with the local area would to not disturb um natural wildlife um or ecosystems that are, are around there so um you know i think there are more visitors that are coming to site and if we can make this uh more accessibly and safe for people to to go around then uh we're we're all we're all very very keen to to do that thank you very much luke I'm very much aware that the time is chugging on. I've got four questions left. I will quickly go through them, if we may. Um, the first one from Liz. Liz Bullard. Hi again, everybody. Um, firstly, I want to say I think it's an excellent idea. Um, 
on the Wimbledon one, I mean, I know that area intimately, having been born and bred there, and I've ridden around those woods hundreds of times, I imagine, before Wimbledon was even thought of. Um, but I imagine the wet piece you're talking about is over on West Hill, and I personally wouldn't have thought that's an insurmountable um, issue really there. Um, and the previous the previous speaker actually brought up my concerns, really, is the, the multiple users of these uh, cycle trails, um, because I know in North Devon, um, on the Target Trail, we recently did a new PSPO on it, and there was a really heated debate on there between the dog walkers and the cyclists, and the cyclists are just rushing up behind people and frightening their dogs and everything, and, and I think they've had to address the signage issue and get the cyclists to be uh, more respective of the other people using this, and they've had to put up signage and stuff, and I understand that people are Obviously, cyclists, when they're coming up behind people, are asked to like, sound their bells. <laughs> you know, people say, well, you still, you still got a bell on your bike. Let people know you're coming because, you know, it's, it's frightening people. And are you actually liaising with the North Devon Council team who do the Taka Trail? Because they've got great experience on dealing with these issues. I haven't been liaising with them specifically for this project, but we have been in touch um, from the Steam Coast Trail with them in the past and taken advice from them and the great work that they do. But um, no, I haven't specifically for this. We've um, it, it's something that we could be happy to do and see how they have addressed that user conflict when it's arisen. Yeah, yeah no, I completely understand. It's 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 a really important issue and one that we take very seriously. I mean, they, in Scotland, the the Land Reform Act from two thousand and three was permitting, you know. All, all path you pretty much all users access to land for education or for recreation and that sort of thing and that's turned out to actually be really successful because you're only permitted to do that if you're doing so responsibly so it is just it's it's understanding who else is going to be around and it's respecting that rather than feeling that it's it's it belongs to one person or another or one group or another yeah yeah and our next thank you thank you very much Liz. our next question is from bill cash Okay. Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm sorry, I may have missed this earlier. Uh, very interesting proposals, Sarah, and I can see their appeal to families. Could you just share again um, the research you've done? You've obviously tried to cancel, you know, get some views of what the public would like to see or what's perhaps deterring them uh, from bringing some families on cycling holidays to date. Um, did you share that earlier? I may have missed it. Did I share the research that we based the feasibility report on? Yes. No, the feasibility report is going to be hosted on the website, so there will be an edited version that won't contain quite as many of the references that I have previously had, but I'd be very happy to share with you the research that I've used to base this on. Right. Okay. I have a lot. <laughs> well, yes, I think we'd just be interested because it looks like obviously it's quite a major um, project, both of them, and I'd just be interested to understand well, actually how many people is it going to ultimately serve, you know, what numbers are you expecting? Um, and also, just in terms of timescales, if you got this through, when would you expect it to be made available for people to enjoy? What's your expectations there? Dan, can I hand that one over to you? I think that's more for you. Is that OK? Yeah. 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 So a lot of these are questions. Some of these, Bill, are questions to be answered, you know, through this process, you know, because we're, we're still, although it's taken us this long to get here, um, we're actually still at quite an early stage with this project, you know. Um, and there, there are things that we don't currently know. So some of those might be addressed by the consultation and other things would have to be addressed should we decide to move forward. So if we get public support for these projects and decide to move them forward, we need to A, look for funding, B, do you know more, you know, get hold of more of that kind of um, evidence to support any application for funding. So there's, there's multiple steps along the way. Um, so we haven't got answers to all your questions, but the, the evidence we have got uh, will be referenced on the in the report, which will be on the website as part of the consultation. Um, is, thank and we'll you. move forward. Okay. Is, is the link that Sarah showed on her last slide live? Is that viewable? It's not live just yet, is it, Dan? But we're hoping within. When would you say? Yeah, within a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Use that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And we, we will be contacting um, all affected parish councils and coastal community team groups. And so we have already identified all the stakeholders that we want to get the opinions of this project on. And so we will be contacting them in the very near future directly. So um, hopefully no one will miss out on when this does go live. OK, thank you very much. Anthony Howard, your light came on and then went off. 
did you have a question that you missed or? Um, well, Councillor Liz touched part of it. I do. We're one of these families that uses. I go out cycling every weekend as a family, as you know, Mike. Um, and we in lockdown we did use a lot of Exmoor. But we became like Olympians with the, the hills we have around here. So my family sort of take me over to Tartar Trail quite a lot. And I was saying, as Liz said, they have improved the signage. They prioritise the the pedestrian first and make sure that the cyclists know of the walls, cycling on the left, and et cetera, et cetera. That would be a very good idea for your pass around here. But what I was thinking about is obviously I'm in the middle of Exmoor where there's a lot of hills. And, but we have some really great cycle paths around here, but not everybody will be able to cycle them because they are tremendous hills. Have you thought about a scheme of doing electric bikes between points? Instead of making paths cycle routes, make the paths that we do have accessible to all by offering electric bikes, like they do in the town councils, etc. Yes, we've thought about it. So this is a slightly wider piece of work, so I'll answer this one if that's OK. I'm sure Sarah knows loads about it and can chip in potentially. But um, yes, we have thought about it. It's 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 part of that more general conversation about cycling. And as part of this consultation, we are asking some more general consultations to get some more general questions to get people's views. Um, the e-bike, uh, electric bike technology has improved and improved. And more, prob probably more importantly, the cost has come down of buying those uh, kind of um, bikes and they're becoming more popular so we are aware of this they can legally be used on any public bridle way um, already um, to be honest the road network is a big frustration as well because we've got this wonderful you know network of quiet small roads um, which in reality are quite usable by people if they've got the confidence to use them um, so there's definitely a, a sort of wider piece of work about um, encouraging the use of electric bikes making them more available somehow improving people's confidence looking at uh, the road network looking at the public rights away network and again that could potentially depending on the sort of funding source that we might uh, tap into that could be done as part of this project or as a separate piece of work um you know so that it's it is a really interesting area but this the focus of this particular work so far has been on creating new relatively easy level routes as opposed to that that sort of um wider um wider project good thank you dan that's very much i'll bring this um subject to a close now very interesting and i'm sure that um everything will come to light at the end of the tunnel as we say um we were due for a break but i think it's uh, getting late now, we ought to press on, if that's all right with you, Hazel. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Dan, for your presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. We'll go straight on now to the update on the landscape review. And this is being uh, presented by Sarah Bryan. Sarah? Anyway, I'll turn my mute off. That'd be helpful, wouldn't it? Thanks, Chairman. Um, I'll try and be brief because what I really want to do this morning is, or this afternoon, is hear from you. You probably don't want to hear too much from me. I am assuming that you have all seen the response and that you've read the, the landscapes review before that. So just by way of a quick um, recap, 2018, the 25 year environment plan came out and that of course had the commitment to, to look at AOMBs and national parks. Um, are we still, are our purposes still fit, fit for the 21st century? Were there any changes needed? So government fairly quickly under Michael Gove announced um, a panel that were to review the national parks and AOMBs. It's led by Julian Glover. Um, and it went about its work through 18, reported in 2019, 27 proposals. Um, the big new story, I suppose, was a National Landscape Service. Um, but in amongst that were a lot of proposals to improve nature, to deal with climate change, to be stronger on social inclusion, to review governance. Um, but interestingly, also some commitments to additional resources. Um, there was a strong recognition of the need for 
local communities to be properly represented in national parks. And um, there was a suggestion around the, the, the duty, social and economic duty becoming a purpose. We waited and we waited. We had, um, we had a global pandemic, which slowed things down, obviously. But the final response from ministers, well, we had a ministerial response last year, didn't we, in June. And then we had um, the document which came out in January this year, which really outlined the government's proposed response with a series of consultation questions. Um, I am in the last stages of pulling together a report with, with colleagues to take to authority in a couple of weeks' time. So today is really timely. We've had discussions with members already and through the partnership plan groups, um, but I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. Obviously, I don't want to talk too much because I do want to hear from you, but I'm just going to quickly go through a few slides to set the framework. I'm going to try sharing my screen and fingers crossed. Okay, can you see the screen? What yes. Is the you? Yeah. Fabulous. No. Okay. So moving to the set, I can't now see you, which is very weird. Moving to the, the next slide, I've kind of pulled it together into these six broad areas. So there's some discussion on changing our purposes. There's some discussion on our, our role in the new environmental land management schemes. There's some ideas to uh, give us stronger powers to manage visitors. Um, there's some changes proposed to AOMBs. There's some legal bits and pieces around powers and duties on public bodies. And finally, there's some proposed changes to governance. Now, in amongst the document, you will have seen that there's also quite a lot on nature and climate and social inclusion, but government is setting out that that is happening anyway and is happening through other mechanisms. What they particularly want is our thoughts on these, these particular areas. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly um, because then I want to do want to hear from you. So the first proposed change that's significant is, is do we support um, a strengthening of the first purpose and a change in the language? So at the moment, you will know that our purpose is to conserve and enhance natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage. The proposal is that we include um, the need to drive nature recovery, to achieve nature outcomes, um, to change the language to make it a little more modern, I suppose. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Um, and also that climate change and our response to climate should be included. So go, I'm, asked, I'm going to go through these all quickly first and then we'll sort of come back through. So the first one is about change the first purpose, bring in nature more strongly, bring in climate as a specific reference. On the second purpose, which you'll know at the moment is to promote opportunities for, for people to understand and enjoy our special qualities, um, it is proposed to specifically reference removing barriers to people who can't easily access national parks. So it's about social inclusion, it's that leveling up agenda and also to refer to health and well-being. Um, again, this is, you know, it's more work for national park authorities. I wouldn't say this is a new topic. This is something we do anyway, but it's making it much more clear that that's our role. So I want your thoughts on how you feel about that. Thirdly, at the bottom, you'll see underneath of just a reference that they've rejected the call for a, a third socio-economic purpose. So also any thoughts on that? Okay, moving on. Moving on, not quite, quite that quickly. Um, many of you will have heard about the Farming in Protected Landscape Scheme, whereby, whereby all national parks and AOMBs have been given quite a substantial amount of funding um, over three years to deliver a program of, of agri-environment support, which is delivering national park purposes, working with the farming community um, as they're helping us to do more for, for nature and access, climate and people. There's a long list of questions in there about our role, and it's really saying how close do you think national parks and AOMBs should be 
to the new environmental land management schemes. I know there are quite mixed views out there on this. Um, so again, what your thoughts are from, from what you're hearing from your communities and particularly from farmers um, about how they feel about the national parks being involved in this. There's a, a section on new powers for national park authorities, things like fixed penalty notices, traffic regulation orders, um, to try and control visitor pressure. Um, this was an issue for us during COVID, but, but probably nowhere near to the extent it was for many of the other national parks, which is where some of this has probably come from. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Um, possibly don't want to focus too much on this, but there's two questions around some of the wording, some of the legal language. So the first is that at the moment, other public bodies, so county and district councils, uh, forestry commission, those sort of people, have to have regard to national park purposes. And the proposal is that they should probably have to further national park purposes. So changing the, um, the emphasis there. And secondly, this issue of power of competence, which is an interesting one, this relates to our ability to raise income. Um, government has said very clearly there will be no more public money. So if we are to survive and thrive, we need to find money from other places. And this is about making it clear when and where we can do that. Okay. AOMBs, I don't think we've probably got time to talk too much, but the proposals are around bringing in a second purpose, making them statutory consultees on management plans. And finally, there's quite a long section about governance. And um, there's some detail in here we probably don't need to go into, but there are proposals about you know, improving training, uh, improving sort of ensuring that, that good performance across, across members. Um, there's quite a lot of discussion around whether the size of the board is appropriate with the 22 that we currently have, whether the representation is correct, having counties, districts, parish and sector estates, and whether the balance is correct, whether, the, whether there are any changes needed there. And there's a fairly unpopular one about um, the sector estate appointing the chair, which we've discussed a couple of times already. And then finally, um, we're allowed to put forward any other comments. Um, we've already had a few thoughts around that. Um, but again, I welcome your thoughts. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now um, and, and see you all, hopefully. I think that was the fastest presentation I've ever done of the Glover Review response. <laughs> So like eight minutes or something. So, okay, thoughts? Any questions for Sarah? It's nice to have the presentation, even though it was quick. It's um, after we've been waiting for it for so long. Um, I've just got one request. Chris, I've got Chris, has still got a mic on, and every so often I can hear a phone going or people talking in the background. I don't know if it's his... Um, Microphone that's picking it. Thank you very much, Chris. That's fine. Now, any questions? We'll start off with Kevin. I don't know any other name. Kevin? Hello. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the social and economic purposes bit. Um, it seems to me that quite often when we're discussing issues around the National Park, questions of economic and social uh, issues are really very closely related to the, the other two purposes. And uh, I'd, I'd just like to be a bit clearer about what exactly it is that we will or won't be able to do through the National Park as a result of the change that's being proposed. Sarah? Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I mean, in a strange way, there is there are no changes proposed. So the current the status quo remains. At the moment, we have a duty to have regard to the social and economic well-being of, of the local communities in furthering our two purposes. So while we are looking after the rights of way or we're dealing with planning or you know whatever it is we're dealing with, we must have regard. Um, there is no proposal to make that duty a purpose. 
So in the Scottish national parks, for example, they, 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 it, is a, it is a purpose, as I understand it there. But, but government has said um, it will keep things as they are, that perhaps it's, it's a, it would be a distraction for us, it would take us away from our, our primary purposes. So the real issue is, is to have regard to words rather than whether it's a duty or a purpose. In terms of the have regard to, that's around public bodies having regard to our purposes. So at the moment, um, say the highway authority wanted to put a road through a national park, they would have to have regard to the natural beauty, the wildlife, the heritage, the access and so on. The proposal is to change it and that would mean primary legislation so that the highway authority then had to further national park purposes. So could it legitimately put a road through a national park and further national park purposes? Does that make sense? I'm not sure that it does, but I, I, it, it, it's slightly tangential to the main issue that I think I was trying to identify, and that was which, which is the stronger version of the wording, which would give the park more power, more ability to manage effectively the environments that it's responsible for and the people. Well, <laughs> that's a complicated question. The, the current wording means in terms of the, well, there's, there's, there's several bits in the consultation. So if you take the first purpose as it is at the moment, to conserve and enhance natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage. The proposal, which is up for consultation, is to bring in nature recovery, natural capital, that kind of language, which you would think would give us a stronger remit mm. to further um, nature in our national parks. The second one, bringing in health and well-being and, and social inclusion, you would think gives us a stronger remit on those, those functions. Government has made it clear it is not bringing in a third purpose. So our current role um, around having regard to the social, social and economic well-being stays the same. In terms of, it, does any of this make us more involved with the social and economic well-being of the local communities? No, I don't think it does. And, and there's, there's no proposal that you could make that would result in that? Or yes, we could. That's the thing the government would accept? Well, we are one voice amongst many who will be responding to the consultation. You know, everyone around this table can go online and respond. You need to do it uh, in the next week or two, I think it's 9th of April, um, and make those comments. And many will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Vivian White. Vivian. Uh, for the record, thank you. Thank you. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I on or am I off? You're on. Good. Thank you. Um, for, the for the record, I'm strongly in favour of the, the third purpose being a statutory third purpose, even if the government isn't. And if there's any way in which we can include that in our representations, I'd be pleased. I only wanted uh, as well to, to take the further opportunity of saying that I think the proposal, the, the proposal that the Secretary of State should nominate the chair is, is uh, disastrous and anti-democratic. Uh, and I, ho and I, I hope it'll go, it'll go no further. Thank you very much, Vivian. Any other questions for Sarah? As Sarah said, everyone is able to put in a comment on these um, on the government report, and you're you're all welcome to do so. But I'm sure that um, Sarah would be interested to hear anything that you've got to say. Uh, the National Park is open to any comments that you wish to make. So uh, if you've got any comments, please send them through, but do it fairly quickly. We are putting together this response and we do need to know as soon as possible any comments that you have. 
Would it be helpful to send um, a link round? Perhaps Hazel could send a link round to the consultation so that people can see it and uh, and run through it. And then obviously, please do send us any comments, send them straight to me. Um, just to be aware, the deadline for, for us to finalise our response in terms of a committee paper is beginning <coughs> next week, so Tuesday. Um, but we are taking it to authority, so... Uh, first Tuesday in April, it will be going to authority, and obviously there'll be a debate there as well. Okay, you'll do that, um, Hazel, please. Thank you very much. Right. We've got no other comments on that. We'll move on to um, number eight, which was emerging issues and topics for wider debate. Um, they'll be presented at the next meeting, if you have them. Um, I think, Mr Silverlock, you wanted to say something. I know it's not on the agenda, but did you wish to say something about the Housing Trust? No? Or the Young Voices? Obviously not. Sorry, sorry, Mike, I think I said it earlier. All right, wonderful, fine, as long as you're happy with that. Our next meeting will be at Willypool Village Hall, and it will be an evening meeting at 7 o'clock. That's been confirmed now, so that will be on Thursday the 23rd of June. That's subject to us all being around after, or many of us, when we've had the elections for um, parishes and everything in May, 5th of May. So if there's nothing else, I'd like to close the meeting. Thank you very much for everybody taking part. Very interesting discussions and look forward to seeing you hopefully in June 23rd, 7 o'clock, with you. Thanks, Mike. Bye -bye. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.